Dr. Brian Lee, who's going to try and help us sort out the three-letter abbreviations of transplant and uh, exchange programs. And where did he go? He was just here. There you are. So, Dr. Brian Lee. Thank you, everyone, for uh, allowing me to kind of share a very passionate part of my uh, practice, which is the uh, living donor uh, transplantation program. Uh, I don't have any financial um, kind of disclosures to make, apart from the fact that I do practice as a transplant uh, nephrologist, and we all have an interest in increasing the number of living donor kidney transplants, so you can take that as a conflict of interest, as you may. I hope that maybe we could um, do this talk in a number of uh, kind of question and answers sessions. So the first question is, why is a paired kidney exchange, or PKE, um, or the other name for it is uh, kidney pair donation, um, uh, KD, KPD, necessary in the first place. So for patients who are highly sensitized, um, with whom you know, they have a living donor, but uh, they're not compatible either, be it ABO blood type or HLA, um, the only kind of means to try to get them transplanted is through the uh, desensitization programs. And none other than uh, Dr. Uh, Jordan and his group at Cedar sinai knows more about desensitization. And it basically shows that for somebody who's got a positive cross-match against their intended donor, they're able to kind of surmount that uh, immunologic barrier by a number of different means. Typically, um, he uses high-dose IVIG, uh, and then he uses uh, CAMPATH as an induction uh, therapy. He doesn't tend to use plasmapheresis as much, uh, and, um, and IVIG afterwards as well. And in this particularly uh, landmark paper that he published in the New England Journal a couple of years ago, uh, it shows about 20 patients who were highly sensitized uh, and who had undergone this desensitization, desensitization protocol, and they were able to bring down their PRA level, the number of antibodies, down in almost every one, one of them. Uh, and as a result, 16 of these 20 patients were successfully transplanted. Most of them did really well, apart from that last person whose creatinine um, kind of took a huge hit. Um, and then the other group that does love desensitization is Bob Montgomery when he was back at Johns Hopkins and his group. Uh, and uh, they typically use a combination of lower dose IVIG along with plasma freezes. And as you can see here, uh, the survival benefit of desensitization and undergoing a kidney transplant still outweighs those who either remain on dialysis alone or remain on dialysis and was waiting for a kidney transplant on a wait list. Um, and he basically divided it up into these different risk categories uh, from those who has a complete negative cross match but only has kind of donor specific antibodies on board to those who has positive flow cross match uh, to those who are in the highest risk category uh, who has a positive cytotoxic cross match and in every single one of those instances the desensitized patients who ultimately got a kidney transplant still had a better survival compared to those who remain on dialysis or were waitlisted. But obviously, nothing comes um, free, and it, it comes at a price. And you can see here, in this particular uh, kind of meta-analysis, oh, um, the little red square indicates that the overall risk of rejection was about 36% in all the de desensitization studies that were out there, uh, of which about 28% of them had antibody-mediated rejection, which we know we don't really have a lot of in the armamentarian in terms of treatment. Um, and this is in comparison to most centers um, that, you know, looking at rejection rates of maybe high single digits, low teens uh, for the HLA-compatible transplants. Um, and again, this is a, systemic, a systematic review of seven retrospective studies and looked at a little over 1,000 patients, 145 of whom had donor-specific antibodies. And you can see here, uh, there's a forest plot looking at the uh, risk of AMR. It favors those who did not have donor-specific antibodies to begin with. And again, if you look at the, uh, the risk of allograft's uh, failure, it also was in favor of those who did not have antibodies, which stands to reason. Um, but to add to the complexity, it's not just the clinical and the, um, the human uh, cost of uh, desensitization. There's also a financial cost to it. And David Axelrod, who does a lot of kind of um, economic modeling in transplantation, he looked at all the live donors uh, who were transplanted between 2000 and 2011 and uh, they basically divided it up into 271 patients who received an ABO incompatible kidney. 62 of them had an A2 incompatible kidney, which, quote unquote, is a lower immunologic risk, um, and t compared it to 26,000 ABO compatible transplants. I can see here that the patient survival uh, was a little worse off in the ABO incompatible uh, 
pairs uh, compared to those who had a compatible transplant and those who had A2 incompatible kidney. Um, and the deaf censored live donor allograft survival was also worse off in the ABO incompatible kidneys. Uh, but more importantly, over the course of the transplant, the adjusted marginal cost was about 32,000 more for the ABO incompatible uh, transplants. And that makes sense because we actually, when, when we used to do ABO incompatible desensitization, um, it, it basically was a huge uh, commitment. There was a lot of financial cost to it, you know, IVIG, plasma freezes, all those expensive uh, procedures. In addition to the f uh, the fact that we actually have to have a dedicated coordinator who coordinates the entire desensitization program. So it ad really adds to the cost. So the question would be, if we don't do desensitization, how are we able to bypass these immunologic barriers in order to, to get these patients transplanted? And basically, I think the answer would be paired exchange. Um, and at UCSF, we participate in two different programs. Um, one of which Dr. Fries had alluded to earlier on, uh, which is the National Kidney Registry. And the other one is the uh, single kidney, single center PKE, which I'm actually gonna spend a little less time on because of all the innovations that's happening within the National Kidney Registry. So it was founded in 2008 uh, by Garrett Hill. Uh, you can all read all about his story uh, on the website um, for the National Kidney Registry, but um, suffice to say that I think he, a number of years ago, wanted to be worked up as a living donor to his daughter. They were not compatible, and he went through this whole kind of rigor of morale and, and found that he was kind of, frustra kind of frustrated with the whole system. And he, afterwards, his daughter successfully got a transplant. He knew that there was a better way to go about it. Um, and I think he came from an IT background, and so he built this very sophisticated software program to try to help facilitate these ABO incompatible and HLA incompatible transplants. Uh, they've done about more than 3,100 kidney transplants to date, uh, and we've, put, we've had about 150 kidney transplants at UCSF um, that's undergone a living donor kidney transplant through them. Uh, the kind of patients that would undergo the uh, paired exchange are those who had an incompatible donor recipient pair. Um, I don't know if I'm gonna have time to talk about the compatible pairs, but there are certain situations where a donor and a recipient would be compatible, but they choose to undergo a paired exchange in order to find the recipient a better matched um, a donor in terms of maybe age and also maybe size as well. Um, patients who do not actually have a living donor um, who are part of what we call the CHIP program, uh, and mostly these are pediatric patients or those who are highly sensitized sitting on the deceased donor waiting list, and they ended up getting advantage by accepting a kidney that ends a particular chain uh, at the end of these uh, swaps. Uh, and this whole system would not work uh, without uh, those you know, completely selfless and altruistic non-directed donors. So as you can see here, the diagram on the right hand side of, wait, left hand side of you um, is um, it's typically what we think about a two-way swap where the donor in one incompatible pair um, donates to the recipient in the other pair and vice versa. A more sophisticated way of think, thinking about it is the chains, where it gets started by a non-directed donor, and that sets in motion a number of series of transplants where the kidneys are flown all around the country, and it, ended up, it, it ends up with probably a chip recipient at the end who receives a kidney. Um, and with more experience, we've been able to introduce this idea of a bridge donor. Uh, you can see here on the left-hand side, a non-directed altruistic donor starts off a chain. And then what happens is the recipient of this pair, R3, receives the transplant, but their donor actually do not go on to donate a, a kidney right away. They're tied over to a, uh, a later time, typically separated by a number of days, if not just a couple of weeks. And then they, in turn, set off in motion a series of different chains of, of events that results in multiple transplants again. Um, in the early days, we would require that all the reci recipients and donors undergo surgery at the same time, just in case, you know, things fall through and, you know, donors change their minds about it. But it turns out that with experience, we notice that the, uh, the donors usually pretty much uh, keep, with their, keep to their word uh, once they know that the recipient has safely received their kidney transplant. So the number of uh, kidney transplants that's been facilitated through the National Kidney Registry has basically gone up, up, and up every single year they've been in, in assistance. Um, and in 2018, they did about 619. Um, and you, you can see that overall, the number of paired exchange in the United States that's recorded by UNOS um, is indicated in the blue bar, and the lion's share of it is actually done through the National Kidney Registry. So they run a very, very lean, uh, efficient system. 
um, and I'm never shy about um, uh, gloating about uh, our successes at UCSF. And you can see here uh, in 2018, uh, we are the most voluminous uh, center with the NKR having done 52 kidney transplants to them. Um, and uh, as a result of you know, more and more patients participating in the paired exchange, the wait time, the median wait time has actually come down as well. Uh, so much so that in 2018, from the time they get activated on the, na on the uh, National Kidney Registry uh, to the time they can get transplanted, it's about less than two months in, in duration. Th this is not to say that by the time they find a, a, recip the, a potential donor, they can get transplanted within two months. Um, in order to get listed active on the National Kidney Registry, the donor and the recipient needs to be completely worked up. Uh, and, and so I don't want to give you any kind of false pretenses. Um, Stuart Fletchner uh, kind of published the kind of median wait times uh, within the National Kidney Registry. And not surprisingly, you can see here that the old recipients tend to have a longer wait time, a mean number of uh, months of 6.48 before they can get transplanted on the National Kidney Registry. Um, and that's longer than any of the other blood types. Um, however, that is, you know, pales in comparison to the nine to 10 years of wait time here in California for old recipient who's sitting on the deceased donor wait list. And as you can see here, um, the left bar, which indicates the National Kidney Registry, they've been able to transplant a much higher number of patients who are highly sensitized with a CPRA in excess of 80%. They were doing about 22.7% of the transplants in these highly sensitized individuals uh, compared to all the living donor kidney transplants that are reported to UNOS across the board. And their outcomes are actually pretty good. Um, they were at least equivalent, if not you can arguably say that it's superior to the other living donor kidney transplants that's done um, for one, three, and five year uh, outcomes. Um, and you know, as they got better at it, the number of broken chains uh, that are you know, involved with the logistics of setting up a, 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 a transplant uh, has fallen over the years. And I just told you earlier on, I was gonna share some of the statistics at UCSF. Um, I don't know how well this projects, but we've done a total of our about 231, and I, did, I looked at this about a month ago, 231 uh, living donor kidney transplants through the paired exchange, of which 202 of them were through the National Kidney Registry, and 29 of them was a single center uh, paired exchange within UCSF. Uh, majority of patients who participated in it would were, were, were either HLA or ABO incompatible. There are a number of CHIP recipients who took advantage of the living donor kidney transplants, um, and s number of them were also participating in it for reasons of size mismatch and age, age mismatch. So the other question that would come up is the, 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 the advantage of living donor kidney transplant is that you have the recipient and donor in adjacent uh, operating rooms, and so that really minimizes the amount of code scheming time. And maybe that goes towards explaining why the living donor kidney transplant outcomes are so much better. Um, but if you start shipping kidneys around the country, doesn't that kind of um, make this complete issue moot? Because you're adding the code ischemic time that may diminish the quality of the living donor kidney transplant. So <clears throat> we've actually looked at this, um, and Port Harasaki and his group actually were some of the pioneers uh, looking at it. They looked at, a, a, in order for a national pair to exchange to function, it is inevitable that living donors' kidneys would have to be shipped around the country because to require these living donors to go and trek all the way around the country in order to donate would probably be detrimental to the paired exchange program. Um, and they look at the number of transplants that were done uh, between January of 98 to 2000, December of 2002. Um, and they basically looked and, and, and compared the top line was the uh, living donors. Um, and the other lines that were shaded uh, un underneath those were from deceased donors. And you can see here that the median uh, code scheming time was about 2.4 hours on the uh, living donors as opposed to uh, code ischemic time stuff with an excess of 15 hours for every single one of those categories. But despite that, it looked like there wasn't much of a separation in terms of the allograft survival. Um, and if you basically sp split up the code ischemic time on the deceased donor kidney transplants into quartiles, um, with each increasing quartile on the code ischemic time, it seems to have made no dent in whatsoever in the allograft survival. Sure enough, it actually increases the delay graph function um, rates in, in these kidney transplants, but we ultimately care about the allograft survival. So it looked like longer code ischemic time doesn't have a, a very measurable impact on the overall allograft survival in the long run. 
Um, and looking at the Australians and the New Zealand uh, dialysis and transplant registry, they look at uh, well over 3,500 living donor kidney transplants. Um, and granted, um, they don't have as much of a distance to travel, but about a quarter of these kidney transplants had cold ischemic times between four to eight hours. Uh, and as you can see here, the cold ischemic time seems to have an impact on the rates of delayed graft function. But when they divided it up into donors who were less than 50 versus those who were over 50, it looked like the overall graft survival was only impacted by longer cold ischemic time in older donors. Um, and the same thing for the, the death sensor grafts loss was only apparent in those who were over the age of 50. So here in the United States, um, we looked at the about 1,200 kidney transplants uh, that were done through the paired exchange, and they compared it to 205 in-center kidney uh, paired exchange that didn't have as much of a ship time and much shorter to cold ischemic time. And then uh, as a control, they looked at 4,800 4, non-shipped kidneys. Um, and the primary predictor here was cold ischemic time, and they looked at outcomes of delay graph function, also allograph survival. And as you can see here, um, that there was a clear separation in the cold ischemic time that was incurred, so much so that the ship kidneys had about a mean uh, cold ischemic time of about nine hours, uh, whereas in the in-center kidneys, there was only one hour of cold ischemic time um, uh, in those, and, 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 and the non-ship kidneys only had 0 0.9 hours of cold ischemic time. And this graph basically represents the distance the kidneys were shipped, and you can see here, many of these went cross across the country from east coast to west coast and vice versa. Um, and the cold ischemic time does tend to impact the, uh, the rates of delay graph function, which we knew about. Uh, but if you look at the overall graph failure, um, death sensor graph failure, and also patient mortality, it looks like the, uh, the, sh the, the fact that these kidneys were shipped and incurred longer cold ischemic time did not seem to have a negative impact in the overall uh, outcomes of these transplantation. So it kind of emboldens us to know that you know, shipping these kidneys doesn't seem to diminish the uh, uh, survival and the allographs of advantage you see with, uh, with living donation. So what if we talk about these HLA incompatibility, ABO incompatibility, what if there was a timeline incompatibility, incompatibility between the recipient and donor? How do we surmount some of the, these barriers? So that's where kind of some of these cutting edge and innovative programs kick in. Um, the National Kidney Registry kind of basically experimented with this program called the Advanced Donation Program, where the donor of a recipient would donate ahead of to plan surgery for the intended recipient. Um, and typically it happens for various different reasons. Um, most of it happens to be, you know, individuals who were in the military and they knew that they had to be shipped out and they wanted to be able to donate a kidney before they were deployed. Uh, other individuals are mostly teachers uh, and they have like that two or three month period where they knew they had a summer vacation. Uh, they wouldn't have to take any time off of their, their, their work uh, and they would donate during that period. Um, and, and, and so for these reasons, the advanced donation program seems to make sense. And only centers that were in good standing were allowed to participate. Uh, and there were absolutely no guarantees whatsoever made to these recipients that although their donors had donated a kidney ahead of time, that the recipient will eventually get a kidney transplant. Uh, and again, Stu Fletchner kind of published the initial experience with this advanced donation program. Uh, and they looked at the first uh, 10 uh, pairs that, that underwent this transplant. And you can see here all the way on the right hand side, the original date of the intended donor donating the kidney to the date where the intended recipient eventually received the kidney was separated anywhere between 10 days to 562 days. So we're talking about a separation of up to about two years um, between the time the donor donated and the recipient received the kidney. So um, there were two patients who were at the time of publication still uh, untransplanted, um, but a more illustrative story of what happened um, was the case number one. So donor number one was the husband to recipient number one all the way at the bottom. What happened was the recipient number one needed a kidney transplant. Um, her husband was getting worked up and in the meantime, while he was getting worked up, she actually got a deceased donor offer. And so she went ahead and took that kidney and got transplanted. The husband realized that he was three quarters of the way through the workup anyway. He decided that he was going to move forward and serve as a non-directed donor anyway. So he got worked up. And in the meantime, while he was completing the workup, his wife sustained a really bad rejection. And it was clear that based on the histologic findings, her kidney was probably not going to last very long. And so it was offered to the husband and said, 
you could participate in this advanced donation program so that your wife at some point will be able to get a kidney transplant. And sure enough, he did participate. And that resulted in 10 additional kidney transplants that wouldn't have normally ha happened had he directly donated to his wife. Um, and his wife ultimately got the kidney transplant. And it's quite eerie. She got it almost to the date, two years after his initial donation. Um, and as I, me as I mentioned earlier on, it's made very clear to the recipient that even though the donor had donated a kidney, um, there's no guarantee that the recipient will ever get a kidney transplant. Um, and you know these are very detailed consent forms for both the recipient and the donor that the National Kidney Registry had crafted, I'm sure with a lot of legal help, um, to make sure that it, this is all signed off on before the uh, donor and recipients participate in the AD, uh, ADP program. So those are patients who get where the donor donated ahead of the recipient, separated by maybe a couple of years. But what if we're talking about a donor who wants to donate years ahead of time uh, before the intended recipient will ever need a transplant? And I think that's where the voucher program kind of comes in. Um, so what happens is the donor goes on to donate, and at the end of it, their intended recipient at the top gets a voucher. I mean, it's not an actual voucher, but it's a promise. And the National Kidney Registry actually tells them when it comes to a date when you need a kidney transplant, we stand by our promise that we will get you a compatible donor that you can be transplanted with. Um, and I can illustrate this with a couple of cases. Um, so case number one is a four-year-old um, kid who had a solitary kidney and has CKD. And it was anticipated that he would probably need a kidney transplant in the next 10 to 15 years. Um, his 64-year-old grandfather wanted to donate, but he knew that by the time the the grandson was going to develop end-stage renal disease, he would be too old to donate. So he went ahead and donated um, in order to allow the grandson to receive a swap at some po future point. And that, trans that donation led to three additional kidney transplants that happened at UCLA uh, in December of 2014. Case number two was a 10-year-old girl uh, who underwent a living kidney transplant in 2007, and it was working really well at nine years. The 54-year-old father wanted to donate uh, to allow the daughter a backup option should her allograft eventually fail. And so that led to eight transplants that were done in August of 2015 at um, Cornell. Um, and the same recipients, 60-year-old Anne, wanted to be double sure that she, she was covered. So she went ahead and donated so that she now sits with two vouchers should she ever need additional transplants in the future. Um, so it kind of overcomes this chronologic incompatibility that we were talking about earlier on. And there's absolutely no guarantees whatsoever these voucher recipients will ever get a transplant. And in fact, many of them may never come through to needing a transplant again. Um, and um, we have to ensure that these advanced donation uh, were truly altruistic. And therefore, the vouchers cannot be bothered for any other recipients. You have to, th th the way it stands right now, the, the donor has to say, uh, the, name the recipient to whom this voucher is valid to. Although things may be changing, um, and I'll come back and update you on it when it does. Uh, and these vouchers have absolutely no cash redeeming value. The original voucher would, expi would expire um, and it cease to exist if the original recipient passes away. And the goal of the transplants is to try to maximize the number of facilitated transplants. And each voucher donor actually facilitates up to about 4.7 additional transplants that wouldn't otherwise have happened. Should the NKR ever file bankruptcy, all these vouchers would become void. Um, and there has to be some kind of a program where they have to prioritize these vouchers, whether it's based on the recipient's uh, sensitization level uh, or whether it's based on you know, uh, the, 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 the timeline. Um, the, the earlier the, the donor donated, uh, maybe those recipients will get some kind of a, a advantage. Um, and those who are hard to transplant, such as old recipients or those who are highly sensitized, may actually get advantage or prioritize in the system. These kinks would have to be worked out um, as, uh, as times go by. And um, we've done, uh, well, the National Kidney Registry it publishes that they've done 130 uh, short-term uh, advanced donation programs to date, um, and of which uh, there were also 46 voucher programs for a to grand total of 176. Um, I wanted to talk about the compatible donor program, but I think I'm gonna skip over some of the slides because there's something that's, I, I thought, probably m worth even more of your time. Um, suffice to say that um, we uh, at UCSF um, 
put together some of the data uh, for the compatible pairs that participated in the National Kidney Registry, uh, and we're submitting this to the um, uh, American Society of Transplantation Congress uh, that's happening next month. Uh, there were total 151 uh, compatible pairs that were participated in the NKR today, and 48% of them had favorable blood types. So basically, a O recipient with a um, uh, uh, non-O donor, uh, and it resulted in 296 additional transplants. Um, a large number of them were very highly sensitized, um, and these patients um, ended up getting a kidney transplant as a result of these compatible pairs participating in the system. So I don't think I'm violating any HIPAA um, uh, regulations here because this was a uh, Washington Post uh, uh, publication. And at first look, it, it probably uh, doesn't look very exciting. Um, on the right-hand side is a daughter uh, who loves her mom a lot, and she ultimately donated to um, her mom. But the story is actually a little bit more complex because she actually did not donate directly to her mom. Um, she wanted to be worked up as a kidney recipient uh, donor to her mother, who just has fibrillary GN. Turns out fibrillary GN has a hereditary component, so she's been turned down as a potential living donor. She was 19 at the time. So she went online, like we all do, Googled it, and she just wanted to know more about pair donation. Uh, and it turns out she happened upon this article that was published by two computer scientists based out of... Um, uh, Carnegie Mellon, um, and they hypothesized the fact that you don't have to stick with th a single organ, so you don't have to donate a kidney so that your recipient can get a kidney. You could easily donate a liver so that your recipient can get a kidney. And she figured, well, I don't have any contraindications for liver donation. What the hell? Maybe I should try it. So she called around the country, not knowing that this was a theoretical paper. She thought this was what's standard of practice. She called around the country, and according to the Washington Post, she was actually patched over to the morgue a couple of times. Um, but she ultimately contacted UCSF, and they, um, they, they put her in touch with John Roberts, uh, as you can see, the tallest guy in this picture here. Um, and he said, you know, very intriguing idea. I'm, I'm willing to entertain this. Let's see where this takes us. And it turns out that she was a, compat she was a, a reasonable, eligible liver donor. Um, but she was petite, as you can see, you see here. And with liver donation, the size does matter. So it took them about 18 months before they can identify a compatible liver recipient um, who's standing right to the left of her. Um, and it turns out that her sister wanted to donate a liver to, her, to, to this recipient, but her liver was too small uh, and wasn't uh, a compatible liver donor. But her sister had a perfectly good kidney to donate. And so it so happened, um, the sister donated her kidney to the mother of the liver donor, and the liver donor then donated the kidney uh, to uh, the, the liver recipient. And that happened, I think, in October of 2017. Um, and they've since met each other, uh, and it is a happy ending, I, I am glad to report. Uh, we, we actually ultimately reported this as a case report uh, and was just published in the American Journal of Transplantation. And it's the uh, number one uh, liver kidney swap that happens uh, in the US um, and, and probably in the world. Um, and you know, it kind of basically um, upends the usual uh, conception of what a paired exchange is where a kidney uh, gets you a kidney. Uh, here, in this case, a liver gets you a kidney. So ultimately, uh, the paired exchange functions to allow transplantation in immunologically incompatible pairs. The national uh, uh, kidney, a, a national kidney paired exchange program could leverage a larger donor pool, the expertise and the resources that's denied to smaller setups. Uh, judicious involvement of compatible pairs in the paired kidney donation uh, will benefit all that was involved in the, in the transplantation and paired exchange. And the transplant of kidneys does not seem to negate the benefits seen with living kidney transplants, as I alluded to earlier on. And innovative programs can further enhance transplantation options for those who are difficult to match. And with that, I will end my talk and um, take any questions. Um, yes. So a question about the voucher. It's a, it's a very interesting idea. We all in this room, uh, the general nephrologists, we see patients with chronic kidney disease who we think are going to progress to end stage renal disease maybe in three or five or seven years. The question to you is, is a technical question. If they hear about this and they have loving family members, they may want to come and get a voucher, but we can't refer these patients to you until their GFRs are less than 20. Uh, so does 
Do we have a new workflow for that? Um, we're talking about it because um, the one thing that I alluded to, but I didn't kind of expound on because it's kind of uh, things in the works is remember the voucher program, the donor actually has to specifically name recipient. The National Kidney Registry is talking about a system uh, where they're borrowing from T-Mobile from a few years ago, um, where remember that you have FAF5, you can name five people that you can call unlimited times and it doesn't count towards your minutes. So they're talking about donors who can potentially name up to five uh, different potential recipients. And any one of them can eventually get a transplant as a result of this particular donor do uh, donating. If that goes in place, then yes, we're going to have to put in place a system where even though the recipient may not be quite ready for transplant and we normally wouldn't work up the living donor, um, we're going to have to put in place some kind of a system to allo allocate that. Good question. or less? Just so you know, you can refer uh, with a GFR of, of 25 or less for an evaluation. Um, I just wanted to clarify that. Um, some centers even accept patients with a GFR of 30 or less. Um, but we do see them, so just, just be aware that you don't have to wait till the GFR is less than 20. I just wanted to clarify that point. So just for an update for you, Brian, the National Kidney Registry did complete the pilot program and the family voucher program is going live as of June 1st. So it is going to go forward where a donor can step forward and name five potential family members um, as an option. So there are things that are changing as of next month. And that's Valerie. She's uh, in charge of the paired exchange. So if you have any questions, she's the one to bug. <laughs> Thank you, that was an uh, excellent talk. So the question I had for you is, given that um, instead of directly donating to someone, you actually trigger more kidney transplants if you go through the paired, is there a push towards just recommending that? Or what do you tell people if they are directly compatible, would you still ask them to do the paired? So yeah, that's actually a question that we've been uh, battling with. Um, and um, at some centers, um, for example, um, it's, uh, there's a program in San Antonio where every single living donor um, is put into the paired exchange by default, uh, whether they're compatible or not. Um, I, I think we, 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 we debated it. And um, because, you know, to put these patients into the National Kidney Registry um, does require a lot of logistical things. Um, and sometimes chains break apart just because, you know, we, we are at somewhat at the mercy of donors and recipients at different centers. And it would be a lot cleaner if, you know, we are able to facilitate this within our center alone. But, you know, um, we, we thought about it. And I think if there were clear reasons to encourage a, a compatible pair to participate in the paired exchange, uh, we've been doing it. For example, um, donors and recipients who would normally be considered compatible, but it turns out that the recipient has a very low titer donor-specific antibodies that we could do a little desensitization and getting them through to the transplant, but we figured maybe it's not even worth that risk. If we put them in the paired exchange and we find them a compatible donor through the paired exchange where there's no donor-specific antibodies whatsoever, maybe that can translate into better outcomes. In those individuals, we've actually spoken to the, pair, uh, the, kidney, uh, the donor and the recipient pair about potentially participate as, participating as a compatible pair. Um, and in, in individuals where there's a huge size um, and maybe an age mismatch between the donor and recipient. We've uh, approached that topic of a compa participating in compatible pairs, uh, but we have not rolled it out uniform, uh, uniformly across the board. And then just one more uh, yeah. follow-up question. So let's say somebody donates a kidney and names somebody else's and they get the voucher, and what if this person also ends up needing a kidney transplant? What happens in that instance? They don't have a voucher, but they've already donated a kidney. Valerie can correct me if I'm wrong. The voucher still s is holds um, holds value for the recipient that the uh, the donor had initially intended it for, but given the fact that the donor had donated, they get advantage in terms of getting a kidney transplant through the National Kidney Registry. Um, I think there's a prioritization, but they're probably third on the list of of priorities in terms of them getting a transplant should they eventually need one. Thank you.